Welcome, welcome. We are going to be talking about tech stack secrets today and uh, dissecting the tech stack. I really, <laughs> uh, really love this word because there are 10,000 vendors. And, um, you know, recently my co-founder Julian Nimchinsky and I did a, a white paper where we researched this and uh, were able to unveil quite a few of them. I also wrote a book called Tech Powered Sales. And um, I looked at about 400 different tech stacks and posited certain types of companies that would blend them together. And that's kind of how I found out about Rightbound. Um, but before doing that, um, thank you for having me, uh, Elisa and Ronnie. How's everything going? It's going. Um, it is. It's Tuesday. I was just like, wait, what day is it? Um, it's Tuesday, and I'm so happy to be here, everyone. Um, I guess, Justin, maybe in a minute you can kind of reintroduce yourself, but just to kind of set the stage for everyone as everyone's getting in, um, I'm Elisa Turner, the Social and Community Manager at Rightbound. Um, we've got Ronnie, VP Marketing from Rightbound as well on the screen. And we're hoping to get some more of you guys um, kind of involved in the conversation. Event today is dissecting your tech stack, and we really want um, to do just that. So if you're feeling shy and you have a question, go ahead, you know, put it in the chat. I'll keep an eye on that chat for us. Um, if you want to like ask Justin a question or myself or Ronnie a question, um, go ahead and do that raise hand function or get my attention somehow, and I will kind of add you to the panel so you can um, interact with us. So I think that's kind of it for today. We're going to run about 45 minutes, um, hoping to be respectful of everyone's time and kind of um, get going. So Justin, I know you've got like a new book out. You've got a lot going on. So kind of kind of tell us about that. Yes. So I can't announce the new title of the new book, but I, I wrote it with Julia and it's about marketing GTM. So there'll be a lot more about that coming out. But I think what has kicked off um, this meeting and just um, you know, the privilege of getting to evangelize tech stacks like Rightbound is really tech powered sales, which has been on the market for about a year. And it lays out the future about two to five years ahead and all the way toward 2035 and 2050. And where it really looks at is autonomous campaigns, because even three to four or five years ago, 70% of what salespeople do is automatable. I'm already looking in the chat and seeing uh, friends like Stephen Brady and Tolo Fasusi and, uh, Zach Selch and just Howard Tan, just calling some folks out here. Cameron Halstead, um, happy to elect any of them. I know Stephen Brady has a pretty incredible tech stack right now, um, <laughs> and Tolu too. Um, but yeah, so I guess I was I was talking to Steve Richard about four years ago, and he pointed out to me that there really hadn't been a book where sequences and cadences and the actual messaging had ever been put out. And that's what led me to look into uh, revenue operations and RevOps. It's also peculiar, if you looked on LinkedIn at the hashtag, there's only about 1,100 followers of RevOps. So I think it was in 2018, I wrote a, uh, wrote a post on LinkedIn back when the articles were really trending called Sales Runner 2049 Beyond Sales Development. And I even have like a hidden Spotify podcast about this. Um, I made a ton of prognostications and predictions about what the tech can do. Uh, where the M&A will go and who I think will buy what. And having written this book, all the best SaaS sales tech in the world flows to my doorstep, humbly speaking. I mean, people come out of the woodwork and show me all this stealth tech, um, in, including Rightbound, which is not stealth. They're out there. You can use it. And uh, I'm just excited to be here. Uh, where can we go from here? Cool. So um, again, just a reminder, if you want to engage in the conversation, raise your hand. I'll add you to the panel so you can speak and show your face. If not, put it in the chat. But I do kind of want to kick off with um, a topic that came up in our um, kind of like pre-session group chat, you know, what are the best sales tools out there? And I think I was a little bit surprised um, in my sales naivete that people were saying, you know, phone and LinkedIn, and I'm going to throw email in there. Um, so I know that was kind of like a tongue in cheek question, but I'm curious, like, do you agree that these mainstays are going to carry us into the future? Or where do you think that role is going to be as we get like newer tools? Are we still going to have need for um, those kind of basics? Yeah, so I wrote about an essential stack and an advanced stack. And a lot of folks here have, um, they've read this book. 
But what's interesting is the era of, is it phone, is it email? Really all of us are sitting in LinkedIn um, on Sales Navigator because we sort of have to pay for it now, whether you're in premium or you have a Navigator license. And then the minute you go into Sales Navigator, you can't get direct dials or direct email addresses. So you have to find that. Um, so that is, what I really talk about is layers, like a layer cake of the stack. So if we're sitting in the social selling Bloomberg terminal with 840 million people, now we have to get their emails and phone numbers so we can actually reach them any possibility. And then it makes no sense in 2022 to send a single email when you could automate 150 a day. And it makes no sense to do a single call. Now, a layer above that is going to be, you know, having like AI assisted or something above your top funnel that's running autonomously with its own layer cake and stack serving your team warm elites. Now people are doing that through demand generation. They're doing that through intent data and things like, you know, six cents. And um, another thing is when they hit the front of your site, you've got to have interactions, uh, automated chat bots, people sitting in the chats and be catching them in that zero moment of truth. Um, and probably provoking a lot of people at this point, which is good. Can I, can I pick on some folks to come up as panelists? I mean, if they're open, like, like maybe Tolu or Steven or. Um, do you there's... recognize people from the yeah. attendees, Justin? I do. Like uh, there's a, a bunch of folks here that I, I do recognize. Do you recognize anybody? I, I think David Youngblood too. Um, oh, <laughs> my friend Garrett, who taught me everything I know about sales. That's helpful. <laughs> wow. So maybe we could pick somebody. Oh, you've been uh, chosen. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, let's choose. Like, come on down. Let's talk to you about your tech stack. Because I think what's most interesting here is not just the predictions in the book. It's like what all are you, all of you are using, how you're having success, and the questions you have. You know, we just kind of make this a brainstorm rather than just uh, some flat slides. I build a lot of pretty decks, but <laughs> Garrett will tell you that's not how we win the deals. Um, let's see. Who can we bring to the panel, Elisa? Well, I am going through and I am I'm being that guy and I am just um, the people you pointed out, I'm allowing them to talk. So anybody who wants to talk and kind of share, um, I am running down the list and giving you all permission, giving you the stage. Well, it's a loaded topic, Justin, and thanks for having me. Um, I have utmost respect for everything that you do. Obviously, you know that. But for the rest of the studio audience, Justin is the best. Um, I learned everything from you, which is also good. Uh, it takes a great team, you know? It's a bi-directional, uh, I guess, collaboration that that moves the needle most. So yeah, just in terms of like the tech stack, I mean, I, I think, you know, there are definitely tools that I could call out, um, strategies, best practices, stuff like that, just kind of depends on where you want to go. But I can say that, um, the tools that I have found most valuable are, are drift and outreach, um, and, you know, troops and Salesforce and having all that strung up, uh, or strung together so that, you know, you're automating Slack and, you know, all that's now part of the Salesforce mega, mega company, but, um, having those components, uh, really automates a lot of the manual processes of, you know, updating Salesforce and waiting for things to load and pointing and clicking and searching and doing. You can do a lot of that directly within Slack. Um, you know, looking up an account, updating opportunities, adding contacts, all of that can be done in a much faster uh, workflow. And then obviously, you know, Drift or any other chatbot technology, like you've got to have you know, so whether it's a, a live person on the back end of it, or if it's automated flows based on customer type, you know, a lot of that can get, uh, can be, you know, improving user experience and getting people to the right content that they're thirsting for, um, to drive engagement. And then, you know, obviously, you know, following up with uh, more personalized, you know, uh, setting meetings and call to actions around booking appointments and stuff like that. So, I definitely have used it all. I do have favorites, but hopefully that helps kick the conversation off uh, with your setup there. Um, I would love to be able to share a video. It's great to see you uh, or hear you, Garrett. Um, I remember the first time I think I ever met you in person, you had like this awesome setup of automation with all sorts of emails going out and personalization automation. I was just so impressed because 
you typically don't see, and maybe that's changing now, but like GMs and C-levels and people running the sales team who are deep in the weeds, orchestrating and collaborating with the teams to build out the sequencing. And I think that's really important for frontline managers to go and like lift the hood and go look at the emails and the setups and the frequency and the cadences that are being used and not just look at the tech stack, but really get into the weeds and figure out, you know, the sharpest point of the spear. Um, great share there, Garrett. I mean, those are all awesome technologies. We've got some other people elected here. We got Lydia and Steven. Any comments on that stack or you want to share yours? Uh, can you hear me? This is Steven. Hey, yeah, no, I would say uh, one, a strong reiteration for, for troops. Big, big fan. I've used it in a, a couple of orgs and <clears throat> and planning to add it here in my uh, uh, latest growing team. Mostly because people just, everyone lives in Slack and it's it's kind of like the closest to Justin's, uh, you know, single pane of glass kind of idea, right? Where uh, any, any and all things that you can integrate will be helpful um, and Salesforce is, you know, notoriously difficult to work with. So um, I've really loved the bi-directional syncing. And plus, it's really great to pull in other um, other parts of the org, right? Cross-channel stuff where they don't maybe have Salesforce access and you can just deliver the information real quickly. One thing I would also add that I've I've sort of, you know, uh, come, come to the other side and, and, and found really helpful is some LinkedIn automation. Um, what we've used is expandy we, we sell to uh, canadians at the uh, keep my my current uh startup and we find just a crazy amount of engagement with pretty pretty simple open-ended like generic outreach on linkedin and in my previous life i was working at a SaaS that was doing email automation with a focus on recruiting and also like scraped linkedin for data and we were really staunchly against a lot of LinkedIn automation for good reason, TOS issues, and it's hard to, hard to play the cat and mouse game. Um, but I would plug Expandy. It's not a great UX, um, honestly. It's not well designed, but it does the job really well. And for folks who are trying to get rid of the tedium of a lot of manual tasks, uh, I would give that a look. Awesome. Um, I think Elisa is also promoting your video, so don't be shy. I'd love to get some more faces up here. Um, <laughs> I lost the link. There, right? Sorry. Sorry about that, Elisa. If you I can. Lost... I can I can go back. If anybody <laughs> wants to be promoted to panelists to be on video, just raise your hand and I'll come through and I'll, I'll tap you in. We'd love to make this a discussion. Um, great share. Steven, I think a lot of us are like, can we automate LinkedIn safely? Are there throttles? I mean, some of these systems figure out how many open profiles there are and they see they can do 900 of that. And then they figure out a throttle on how many seconds to push. And I really didn't talk about this in my book because it's it's dangerous, not for you necessarily, but if it cries afoul of the terms of service, you know, you can go to the dreaded LinkedIn jail, which basically they turn your profile off for 24 hours. If you write support, they're always pretty nice about turn your profile back on, but you wouldn't want to get turned off too many times. Um, <laughs> let's see, Lydia, what are you thinking about here from a tech stack perspective? Oh, well, I don't believe in stacks. Silos kill. And so that's our mantra at Ventive because it's a complete seamless platform that includes everything you need to build, grow, and manage your business, whether it's a startup or enterprise level. Um, and, you know, our, our whole goal is to make sure that our customers never miss an opportunity. So, uh, you know, a contact, uh, and Stephen, thank you for, uh, mentioning how onerous Salesforce can be. Venev is completely no code and a contact is not a separate record from a lead. Lead is simply a phase of the relationship. So you want to be able to build that relationship from the first touch throughout the entire uh, lifetime of that engagement. And that's what we do at Ventive. Well, it's all good and I appreciate that uh, plug because that's what we're all here to do, right? Transact and, and show each other the cool gear we're, we're building. Um, Brandon, welcome. Hey, how you doing? Uh, Justin, good to be here. Um, I, I, I got here a little late. It said, was the question like, what's my tech stack right now? Or 
yeah, we'd love to look under the hood and just share it, you know, and maybe talk about some of the ones you've tried and why you've settled on this one, because we can play favorites all day, but hearing from, you know, the folks in this community about the hit and miss, I mean, I think the thing I would stress is like for data vendors, it really depends on your vertical and your geo. And mm -hmm. I mean, before sharing the stack, maybe just a, you know, a sentence or two about, you know, what problem oh. you solve and what your ICP and persona is so we can understand why the stack fits versus like, Apollo right. is the best or something. Right. So uh, I'm with a company called Sprout Social. Um, our ICP, we're a social media management software, all encompassing listening, analytics, I mean, publishing the whole nine yards. Who we usually target is like practitioners, social media managers, seniors, as well as VPs of marketing, I guess CMOs as well. Those, those sort of executives. Um, the current stack is Zoom Info, LinkedIn Sales Nav, Salesforce. We got Gong, we have Outreach.io. Um, I think we just got this thing called Six Sense, which I haven't touched yet. Um, I mean, I'm still two weeks into this job. The reason why I chose this tech stack is because it's the one they gave me. And I've also, which I'm not too sad about because I hear it's pretty good, all of these things. Oh, and Zoom Info as well. So I, didn't, I said that already, um, if that makes sense. That's a great one. Um, did you try other tech vendors and stacks before you chose that uh, one? I, I mean, I had tried, I had, I tried close that IO like at a different job, but I, I don't know, it, it seemed all right. I, I didn't see anything particularly special about it. Oh, and uh, ring central as well. We're using um, one. I got a question later, uh, but that's all I got for now. No, I'd love to hear your question. Uh, well, it's more of like a, so I'm learning it and I learned that gong gong records uh, cold calls through ring central, but right now the company's not doing it for whatever reason. It's a thousand person company, but uh, for whatever reason, they're recording all the zoom calls, but not the cold calls. So how do I tell my manager that without making your, I don't like, how do I bring this up without making anyone feel stupid for not already doing this? Sure. So I like to get really into the weeds with all this stuff um, in order to record a call every rep would have to understand the different regulations per state, mm -hmm. but the technology is sophisticated enough to understand which mm -hmm. state you're calling on by area yeah, yeah. and whether or not it's a single party or double party opt-in and whether or not you can record it, but mute out what the client mm -hmm. said. So then you're just, your manager can coach you on what you said. Mm -hmm. And so it's a bit of a um, transformation to implement it at that level of scale without the RevOps infrastructure set up on the back end and the legal mm. controls and so forth. So, you know, yes, uh, William Kenny, great, great response. State registrations, uh, regulations are different. Um, anyone on the phone, David or Garrett, are you recording calls yet? And how have you tackled this one? <laughs> Done it uh, before. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, you first. No, you, by all means. <laughs> All right, you're too kind, Garrett. Too kind, uh, gentleman and a scholar. Uh, literally, short answer: it's the same as you provided in terms of how I've addressed it before and presently. What up, Elliot? Uh, presently, actually, um, in a stealth mode for another startup, so I'm shopping right now. So wanted to come and kind of see what the current iteration of everyone's latest faves and craves are. So this is a very interesting seat for me to be in personally. Hmm. And a uh, great response, David Garrett. What were you going to say? Oh. He may have lost Garrett. We'll, we'll bring him back. Um, the, oh, uh, right on. Yeah. Oh, he got camera. That's, that's what's up. I lost, my, uh, I lost my stream there, bud. Uh, thank you, Elisa. So, yeah, I just uh, wanted to feel right at home with David and Brandon and all of you. So, thanks for having me. But yeah, I've, I've wanted to have Gong or Chorus or Exec Vision or any one of these tools for the last probably, you know, 10 years of my sales career and just haven't been able to get over the uh, big brother having very, very senior team and um, in some situations, a very complicated go to market where things are not, you know, we're not selling copiers and phone book, uh, you know, cell phones here. So um, <laughs> it's been hard to develop the kind of process that would you know, equate to the value on the back end of recording uh, conversations and then having a very, very senior sales team. It's uh, hard to get over that, that kind of big brother uh, aspect of it. So, um, but I love all of their content. Uh, 
Gong, obviously, well, in my opinion, is has the best content, super valuable, insightful information, even to just follow. But I do want to be a customer one day. So, okay. So the answer to this is Gong will do it, but because of the legal ramifications and with how companies need to deal with that risk, it's kind of hard to get in, especially for bigger organizations. Yeah, and it could be just the cultural dynamic, you know, maybe they don't want to uh, force that uh, recording component on, on their team. I, I don't yeah. know. Because yeah, I really want to see the good, the bad, and the ugly on the phone. But now it's all a, a black box, unfortunately. Oh, well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're getting a lot of really good answers. Um, there's so many directions that we could go. It's so funny, too, because... Uh, I used to just put my cell phone on LinkedIn and I'd always get a call from either Gong or Chorus, which is <laughs> funny because the calling companies are the ones with the aggressive uh, SDRs. Who else has a, a question or a topic? Let's see. Hey, hey, Youngblood. Welcome. Dave, you're shopping. What's on your mind? Like, what are you looking for? I, I hear intent data, six cents. What, what's the coolest piece of tech? I'd love to actually ask this to the panelists now, to Garrett and David and Brandon. What's the coolest new piece of tech you've seen? That's, a, that's an interesting qualifier. Um, <laughs> interesting is relative, right? Based on the user, the use case, and, and your application. So um, for, for me, as far as like neat feature functionality, um, I don't, honestly, I don't know, man. I can't say anything. If, honestly, all of it feels like more of the same. You have different iterations, you know, different colors or different logos, but um, I'm, I'm still looking for like that next, next big innovation, innovative tech for like recent times. Like Gong feels like the last big hit on the radar, right? And then kind of disrupt or the SEP platforms, right? Starting with, with the one we know and then my favorite outplay, right? Uh, so it's just kind of, it kind of depends. Mm. I mean, I've got one. If you yeah. Don't mind. Uh, with God, I just took a thing on Gong today and how you can basically crowdsource good answers to questions. You just search up the terms like budget or or some sort of objection, and you can see the good, the bad. Assuming they're recording all their reps' calls, you can then see how people answered it with what tone and if the deal ended up closing in the end as well, too. So judge it by that. I also can't talk about the stealth tool I'm most excited about because it's not in market yet, but it's coming <laughs> and it's RevOps focused um, or really Rev focused. So a little shameless plug, but. Uh, what does it do? What does it solve? Do you see the use case or no? It's that, it's that um, the Well, the, the simplest for application in, in this call uh, would be, it is a essentially a support and or service layer for better utilization of your data for all the potential applications of it, right? And you can, that's very generic and I'm very sorry, but it, it's its a different approach to the way AI helps um, you leverage and use data for all the applications and revenue operations in your business, all right? That's in a nutshell what it is. I mean, it's interesting, right? There's applications now of, they, things that write for you, things that build the sequences for you. Um, there's a lot of really interesting gear coming out and things happening, but, and then uniting it all together. I think my friend Errol is on now is the CEO of Truly. He has some really cool technology he's building. Can we, can we uh, upgrade Errol for a minute? I think it's his hand raised. Errol, how are you? I tried. <laughs> I, am, I am outside on my balcony, so excuse the. Uh... All right, blow our minds with the hyper automation. Just can you give us thirty seconds of you know, the future? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know where it lines up with. Like you and I haven't spoken in like six months, so I don't know where it lines up with your idea, but. Like for me, after eight years of doing this and working with customers that do all this go to market motion process, whatever, it's like the thing that just drove, drives me nuts is like, you know, how many leads fall through the cracks 
um how many people don't get followed up on like things that are happening like i just want to be everywhere and i'm sick and tired of the the same conversation happening again so two years ago after trying to get people to adopt sales tech like we just sort of took a step back and we're like i wonder if this could be all done by a machine a lot of these processes that we just train and beg people to do so that's kind of what we've been focusing on and we it's called hyper automation and the idea is that we're taking whatever you're doing today it's just like basic if this then that statements and adding a human judgment layer so it'll update the crm um for the person and not only will it do it in real time it can go back in time and do it based on all your historical data um in a lot of interesting ways so that's what we're working on, trying just trying to get rid of the revenue regret almost. <laughs> I love it. Like, we just got a, a really hard question in the chat, and it's amazing because I think Garrett can answer this. I'm trying to make this really interactive, but I, <laughs> I won't put you on the spot. Jake Carlson said, how would you assess and validate new marketing automation platforms? I just started working for Factorial and can act as the DW CDP and omni-channel marketing platform. I'm working on our sports industry vertical, but we have a channel side of the business as well. Anyone looking into marketing automation? I know Garrett sits on the IAV board and knows a ton about CDPs, but it's a good audience question. I mean, that that one's that's really like a $64 Scrabble world there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a lot like the CDP Institute, you know, the list is only growing uh, by the day. Um, I'm not sure what the initialization is for DW. I should data warehouse, I presume, but um, yeah, clean room, bunker, you know, on device, zero party, first party, second party, third party data. Like it's a big, big space. There's a lot of focus around audience and identity and personalization in light of the mounting legislation and, you know, issues with privacy and identity and addressability and marketing and advertising that. Uh, everybody has been laser focused on first party data and identity and solving for that, given the fact that if you're a marketer or a publisher, if you're buying or selling, uh, your first party data usually doesn't scale. And then, you know, the availability of third party data is about to fall off a cliff with, you know, all of these headwinds that I described. And so I know I've dipped into the CDP, um, you know, the difference between a, a DMP and a CDP. Uh, and, you know, looking at the CDP Institute and some of the resources there, like definitely a growing space, hot space, white hot space, um, but a lot of competition, a lot of noise. And, um, you know, overall, I would say like the category is growing. Um, and so that would be my assessment and the validation of that category. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's real. Marketing automation is I'm going to, you know, there's probably a lot of companies that will win in that space and I'll kind of cut it there, but loaded topic, as you mentioned. Super helpful. Who here is looking at marketing automation along with sales automation, like Marketo or ABM or ABS? <clears throat> William, do you want to answer this one? Just part of your tech stack, Errol is for sure. Thanks for all your support, William. What's going on in your tech stack, Wilderness? Oh, my text. Well, I was at a marketing firm and they had Marketo and a bunch of stuff. They, they did all that. That wasn't, they, they kept me away from that stuff mainly um, <laughs> and for good reason. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where to jump in this conversation. Um, I am kind of new to the text stuff and really it's all from your your book there. So what, what my outlay looks like, if this is the right uh, approach, um, HubSpot, um, LinkedIn Navigator, all the rank and file stuff and Salesforce, the CRM didn't really matter. I mean, it matters, it, it doesn't at the same time. Uh, I use Reggie AI, which is nice for, for copy. Like I'm okay at copy, but it's it's a difficult thing to do. So you need help. And that and they have that utility has really improved me for about a year. Um, and they really you can see you can see the, the their improvements. Uh, you can't get, and I don't know if there's a comparable um uh, a comparable service that, that, that can do this, but you can't quite get some inputs and then plug and play and get something out of it. But you can use use it as an idea generator. It's really, uh, really high utility. Um, you know, Lucia, um, Uplead, Seamless, all the regular data stuff. 
Um, and I'm sure there's some stuff I'm forgetting. It's a comb like LinkedIn you were talking about. Like there's like duck soup was just the, the front end was just a mess, just a fucking mess. And they'll really ding you, um, LinkedIn. If you if you start if you start grabbing deep in there, the LinkedIn are like the Hunter IO guys. I think they got dinged. I don't think they're on that platform anymore. Um, so I've used a bunch of stuff. Um, if it's really easy to use and effective, I'll use it. If if it's if it's taxing on, on my uh, my humble abilities, and I just let it go. So that, that's kind of the <laughs> that's kind of the, the, the stream of um, of my tech there. If that answers your question. That's awesome. Uh, Ronnie, any questions that you wanted to have answered or anything we missed in the chat or Elisa and make sure we're not just going rogue here. And Justin, this is Jake Carlson. Uh, just jumping in. Apologies on my, my video on. But uh, but yeah, thanks for asking the question um, I had shared. And Garrett, thanks for thanks for your your uh, your guidance and insight. Um, I had been on the, the team side of the sports industry for 16 years. So learning the terminology discuss, you know, we're discussing here and hearing about some of the different companies is, is brand new. So um, again, just trying to get my footing in, in the industry as a whole and understanding how the marketing automation, which is really more of what we lean into at Factorial, um, how that can be a benefit not only as I mentioned on the channel side, but but in the sports industry overall, because I'm finding it somewhat unique that we can act as a data warehouse, a CDP, and then that omni-channel um, shotgun approach, if you will. But if if that is very common in the industry, again, I know Marketo is a, a big, uh, you know, the big competitor of ours. That uh, just trying, yeah, I was trying to understand how how relevant and how beneficial our services can be um, out there, basically. Super helpful. Um, we had another question in the Q&A, something not mentioned when I was in sales role, this is from Danny Lynch, preferred GMAS to automate touch points to large database of existing clients and partners. I mean, there's a lot, a lot out there. I, I know somebody who uses Woodpecker over at Office 365, just doing like a thousand emails a day. I have seen so many people trying to hack the deliverability, right? There's a couple of big trends. One, you know, Gmail just keeps cropping down how many emails you can send per day. And you can only make so many aliases and you can only launch so many email campaigns so fast. And um, so I think Errol's building some stuff around that, but I just wanna bring everybody in the floor here who wants to talk. Sam, we wanna hear from you. What's going on? Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks. Uh, really happy to join. Um, kind of new to my role, uh, their table learning management company. And um, we've got like every tool you could think of. And it's almost we're at the point where it's oversaturated. And um, in my specific role kind of brought in to help us kind of sift through and train. We've had rapid growth. A lot of new people who are kind of just it's their first kind of stab at BD type roles, AE roles. And so I guess what I'm what I'm interested in hearing from everybody is like how do we model best practice, you know, tailor it to role specific, um, you know, A E B D. Yeah. So how do we model it, and then how do we also optimize it, right? I, when I'm out observing reps, um, they're using Zoom info like probably two percent of what they could probably be using it for, right? And and what's the right it's the right mix of using everything. I guess that's kind of, you know, we have kind of similar tech stack, Zoom info, sales navigator outreach. Um, you know, we've just brought Clue in for some competitive intelligence. Um, you know, a, a tool I'm looking at that I'm really fascinated by uh, is Speckit. I think that that kind of brings the on the job training that, that helps, you know, give people the, the tools they need when they need it. So that's kind of what's on my mind. It's interested in other people's input on that. I could probably say something about that. Just <laughs> um, so here's what I'm seeing. Like I, I spent a lot more time in RevOps on the RevOps side of this. And basically the problem is this. We spend so much time trying to optimize every little part of like the funnel, like trying to make every little bit so efficient mm -hmm. that we've lost like the fun the funnel, the journey part of it, which is where like it's just a mess. Like you're saying. This, where you, this person is using 2% of Zoom info, this person may or may not be using 10%, this person may be using 60% and tanking the domain reputation for everybody. 
And so like, that's, I think that's the biggest problem right now with all this stuff is, and what this like RevOps movement, like it doesn't really matter, like there's 50 definitions, but I think that the overarching problem that I see is like that there's no orchestration in all of this. And so the thing that needs to happen is it's like in product management, they talk about the jobs to be done framework. So you take a step back and you're just like, what's my funnel? Like, what am I trying to do here? Sorry about that background noise. Um, what's my funnel? What am I trying to do? Who am I trying to get through the funnel from A to B? And then you work backwards into the tools from there. And then you can get rid of like so much because like, you know, you, do you need spec it? If like, if you have 50 jobs, you're prospecting, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're closing, you're updating, whatever. Yeah, you need, you're, there's a new process every single day. Yeah, you need spec it. Like, if you have a very clear job with a clear job description, do you need spec yet? By the way, I hear it's a great product, but I'm just saying like, oh yeah, can change every two seconds. Like, do you need that little octopus to pop up every two seconds? Like maybe not. And I think that's what we're trying to do here is like take a step back and just say, what is each person's job? Mm -hmm. And then just say, you only have one main job. Like if you had one job, what was that? What would that job be? And then we just try to give you only the tools for that job. That so has to be the trend. Can I? Yeah. So it's so funny you say that because what kind of brought me to this call was a post I made about that. I, I want, you know, there's nothing out there on the idea seller persona for tech stack, right? Like what it is that like, I, I can't find it at least. So if you've got resources, please for them. like exactly what you said, like what, is exactly what you need to use these tools for. And maybe it's reducing that. Maybe it's not, you know, overflow. And then we can kind of gap analysis exactly what to train to. And then it's a lot easier to, to enable folks to, to do that when you there's a very clear image of what they should be doing. I, I think the challenge is there's just overlap. And then there's also a lot of new ones too. So like as a person who's mismanaged salespeople like a lot in the past, I think what I can tell you is like most managers, like if you have a, if you're a salesperson, right. It's like, you have to go build your pipeline. You also have to close the deals. And then you also have to keep them steady and you have to do this and you have to do that. And it's like, you have 50 jobs and every day your job changes. <laughs> and the only thing you're anchored through is this like one revenue number, which changes its meaning every month. Right. So I think like the whole thing just has to start with taking a step back and just being like, what's my job? right? I can't have five jobs or have, you know, five jobs and every job, every month it's one job. So I think like the most important thing to start with is what is my job or what is, what is each person's job? What are we trying to do? And then you work backwards from that, because I think most of what I'm seeing, I just, most of what I talk about in the RevOps space on LinkedIn and that people seem to agree with is this, like, you don't have a customer success problem. You're closing bad deals. Why are we closing bad deals? Because we're like marketing to the wrong people. And so because marketing is bringing in all the wrong people, all of a sudden I need enablement to, you know, to close bad deals. It's like, if we just get rid of the bad deals, maybe we don't need to be so enabled. You know what I mean? And so it's just about like, it's about cutting. It's not about optimizing. It's just cutting and throwing it all out, I think. Very profound. Who else would like to become a panelist? Uh, Ash, good to see you here. I mean, the, the trends that I tracked in the book were interesting, right? You had Aaron Ross create predictable revenue and that created like, okay, we're going to take an, a Henry Ford assembly line to technology. But then just like the automobile, now we have robots on the assembly line and the humans building the algorithms to train the robot hands. And we have data science analyzing that data and machines building the cars. And so what starts to happen in the supply chain of GTM and revenue creation is subspecialization, where you can moneyball out the roles. So you can take an SDR, drop that headcount, and take that and apply it to tech stacks. Or you can drop off an SDR headcount and hire VAs, or you know, have a more sophisticated data operation, or have an SDR that all they do is data um, analysis and collating, and you know, more like DS type stuff. So. Then there's the consolidation with a thousand sales platforms and 10,000 marketing platforms. If you keep buying all these specialist tools, it's just going to be bloated, right? Um, Ash, what's on your mind? And did anyone else want to get promoted here? 
Uh, Sam, quick question. Uh, who's setting the strategy? Because you said these guys are um, taking a, what was the words that you used? Um, taking a punt at being an AE or something along those lines. So these first timers or they have experience at being an AE or a BD or? You were asking me? Yeah. Uh, we, we have a, I would say a pretty early in their sales career um, group. So a lot of them first time BD. Okay. So, so they're noobs basically. Right. Yeah. So who, who are they relying on to tell them what's the right thing to do? And what, like who's, who's giving them strategy? We, you know, I'm, again, I'm new to the organization. It's a mix. I, I think we have focused a lot on at least the early enablement team that they, we've brought on over the last 18 months. And I'm new again, I'm six weeks, but um, focused a lot on the IQ, EQ, developing ICP, you know, understanding how to make personalized messaging, but there's a, a big gap on just basic sales soft skills. Um, and then, and then particularly how th there's zero, you know, there, there's, we're, we have nothing in terms of tech stack enablement where, you know, almost no content, the, the content that we have are recorded zoom calls, like a, a, a rep sharing best practice. So, um, so, so who's setting strategy? What person is in charge of strategy? Yeah, it's, it's all newer, but Re, Re, our uh, director of RevOps right now. Okay, and he's an experienced sales guy? Um, no, actually, it's she, she comes from a, a similar type, type of role, say revenue. Okay. So you don't have anyone in the organization? I, I, am, I am an experienced salesperson myself. Okay, perfect, right. So why aren't you setting the strategy? Uh, not what I'm brought in to specifically do, but that's a, a good question. I mean, I, I, everything's cross collaborative. So I, I would just say it's early, but I will, will uh, certainly be a part of that and have no, you know, fear. Yeah. It, but no, I would encourage that hundred percent because uh, um, down the line, you know, if things don't go well, which if there's no strategy from an experienced person uh, being established, then things won't go well. Like you can't hope on like miracles or like luck things will likely not go well. You're not the exception to the rule. So then the finger is going to get pointed at you. I've been in situations where I've like played an advisory role and the CEO or the person who's meant to be in charge who didn't have the right experience then later points at the finger, points the finger at the other person. And it's like, well, why didn't you stop me? You're this experienced person. Like you should have told me I'm, I'm being an idiot kind of thing, right? And then at that, at that point, it's kind of like, yeah, you're right, but you're also wrong. But then you can't really say that. So um, I think there's a, the reason I say this is because all the tool stuff is great, um, but tools is a lot like money. Like, you know, what they say about getting rich, like it just amplifies the good of you and the bad of you. So if you're bad financially in terms of management, you're going to get worse, right? So I think tools are similar. They amplify good habits and amplify bad habits. So if you have really bad copywriting, it will amplify your bad copywriting and vice versa. So I think in this scenario, it'll be prudent. Uh, and um, I think a, a, uh, a really good strategy for you to show thought leadership in your own organization to, to sort of take a more consultative approach and get your strategic leader here to see that the tool won't necessarily solve the problem that you'll be basically amplifying, you know, uh, shit. So right now you're going to save a, a ton of money and a ton of headache and a ton of time, ton of opportunity cost by taking the moment to stop. And, you know, uh, what I would say before I go off on like, because I can talk about this like until, you know, the clouds come home, as we Brits say, um, the, the key thing here is that if you take the time to do the mundane, boring work, ICP, more importantly, validation, speaking to people, who are meant to be your ICP and then they get their credit card out and pay you and you then pay attention what was the process that they went through when they and they eventually got their credit card out and they paid us and they signed up and they like uh excuse me uh e-roll apologies if I pronounced that wrong um said if they indeed match your customer success team's uh perspective on what is an ideal customer as well 
then you have a process you can then put on paper, improve, and then when you're happy with it, conversion rates are above industry standard or at least at industry standard and you're happy with it, then think about tools and amplification. Then you're not going to be, you know, six months down the line and then trying to fix the stuff that should have been established in the beginning. That's my sense, two cents. Ash, can I build on, on your point? I love what you said about the amplification. So what I always say is that a lot of software gives the promise of automating manual processes, right? And the question is, are you automating something that works? And if you have software that's only automating what us humans do, let's say we're talking about SDRs, then is that a good thing? Because as you mentioned, it could potentially amplify the poor parts of the process. So can anyone here, you know, maybe Justin or maybe one of the other panelists share sales or sales development um, products that can not only automate what people do, but actually make the processes better. I think some of the people on this call are building them. I just wanted to kind of call out how expertly Ash just pulled like a mini discovery session there with Sam. It was just like pretty expert. <laughs> it was like a little mini medic just banter going, you know, and have you read all those books, Ash? I hope one of them's mine. Uh, just a heads up, my, I'm not actually Ash. Ash is my uh, Ash is my boss technically. I'm his director oh. of sales, and he sent me the link, and he was like, "Jump on this thing, uh, check it out." I don't know if it's useful or not. So, um, my Has name is Sahel. Uh, sorry. Has it been useful? Uh, I think so. Sam got a lot of value out of it, um, and that <laughs> so makes me feel better, which puts me in a good mood, which means I'll close more in the end of the day. So. Value, value all around. Wait, so um, he'll bloom, or what's your last name? Uh, no, it's not bloom. Oh, I know who so. you're referring to. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, nice oh. right. Um, I, I have a question it, actually, just to extend that, just yeah. exactly what Ronnie said. I think this goes back to Ash, by the way, a little bit because that was like so good. I think the pro, I think like the emphasis here is on like what is good, and the problem is like what I. Over here internally, what we've been trying to deal with is if you think about it, like let's say that before tap water, right? There's a river five miles down the path and it's like down the road and you have to go there every day to get your water. And then there's like a tool that comes out and it's like, oh, it's the car or the bicycle. Now it's, now it's easier to go get the water, right? Um, and then the car comes out and you keep doing this. And who is taking a step back and being like, is this the best way to get water? <laughs> like in the first place, how do you take a step back? Um, and it, like, what I wanna just bring back to, I'm so sorry, not Ash, your, uh, was Sahel. Your Sahel. Sahel. So Sahel, like, here's the question, right? Like, what are you gonna say to Sam's CEO? Who's like, yeah, it totally works. You drop Zoom info things in this thing, you get some responses, it closes. What do you mean, like, you know what what do you mean our icp is not tight enough i want results like what do you what do you say to that guy or or gal so uh, what's worked for me in the past is to tell a story because if you make them the example or their company in the example walls go up and it's very hard to break through the ego and the vulnerability aspect so it's always easy to shit on someone else and make them the example and then the ceo is like oh yeah i don't want to be like that guy um, so it's like picking an example, ideally someone that you can relate to, someone in the industry who's made that mistake in your industry uh, and making them an example or in an adjacent industry. So saying something along the lines of, uh, um, you know, um, so-and-so company in our industry did this like uh, a few years back or an adjacent industry, for example, if you can't find someone in an industry. Um, where they pursued an ICP that um, wasn't uh, the right fit, for example. And it meant that the messaging was off, which meant the sales cycle was unnecessarily longer. We added, they added like three months onto the sales cycle, which is time, which is money. So then their ACV, because of the increased cost, reduced, which means they could then spend less to acquire the next customer. And it was a downward spiral that basically ended up potentially tanking the business because everybody knows that you can pay for the most for the customer wins along those lines. So it's all about maximizing ACV and an aspect of that is decreasing sales cycle and decreasing the cost associated to that zero to close process. Um, if you write it all down the argument and make it sort of very logical and easy to follow, 
I found that most executives worth their salt who genuinely care about their business will, will pay attention and will take it seriously. Um, worst case scenario, you just go find a McKinsey study <laughs> and link that or like a Deloitte study. But usually, you know, if they trust you, if they brought you in, I think you'll, I think it will be uh, okay. Absolute worst case scenario, do a two pronged approach. Be like, okay, boss, we'll, and I've done this as well. Um, actually, I did it with Ash, which is um, he had a perspective, a POV on the way he wanted to do it. And, I, and I, w- I disagreed, but I knew that he was sort of, he held strongly uh, on that opinion. And um, I had just joined. So I didn't want to rock the boat too much. Change has to happen slowly. So I said, we do both. I'll do yours. I'll take complete ownership of making sure that it happens at maximum efficiency. And you just give me the opportunity to try my way as well with the promise it won't affect your methodology. Uh, and he was like, all right, win, win. Uh, and obviously I ended up winning, but then it wasn't like, he was happy because it was a result. Just to speak to the point that you said, like, I want results. Um, so that's kind of like this sort of the toolbox that I had, toolbox I have to, to, to try and deal with that sort of uh, a problem. That makes well, sense. Super appreciate the strategic shares. We're getting down to the last five minutes. Um, Ronnie, Elisa, anyone on call? Any questions? Garrett, what's on your mind? Uh, I want to hear from Sam or uh, oh, we lost we lost another Sam or Rachel or I'm still here. Sorry. Oh, you are. There was What's another up? Sam. I'm sorry, but oh, was there? Okay. that person has left. I, I don't, I do want to hear from you again. I'll reach out to you direct, but uh, yeah, thanks for the time and uh, really collaborative discussion. Thanks to Hale for the insightful uh, deconstruct there. That was awesome. It's so funny. You, you end up having a tech stack hour and you get to what really matters, right? We're all just trying to raise the top line, get the right technology. Um, Everybody, please check out rightbound.io, um, you, my book, techcardsalesbook.com. Ronnie, what else can we promote? Elisa, like, want to make sure we, we thank you for the, the house here. Um, well, if there are any um, SDR managers, we are building like a kind of private closed community, just a learning space and networking and growing space. Um, so if you are interested in that, you lead a team of SDRs, definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I'll send you some more info and maybe an invite. Awesome. Well, everyone network, please, on LinkedIn. I'll see a lot of friends here. And uh, if you do a review of my book, I'll give you a free teardown of your email. And some people don't want that. So <laughs> if you haven't taken advantage of that, I, I'm, we're about to break 200 uh, four and five star reviews. I I got one, this is the funniest, just to make fun of myself, where he read it and he said, look, I'm an old school salesperson and this book reads like the manual for a defense contractor when the amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all trying to learn what this stuff is. And, uh, you know, I respect everyone for coming on the call and being, you know, courageous and sharing your stack and your wisdom. Let's all just keep in touch. It's a lot of fun. It's going to be a series. Uh, when's the next one so people can join? Yeah, so the next one's going to be in August. Um... No date, de- uh, I can't talk today. No date nailed down, but definitely um, follow Rightbound on LinkedIn. That's kind of where we hang out. And there will be definitely some uh, more deets on the upcoming events. Can I do a shameless plug? I also want to add um, that uh, Justin's book is also available um, on the digital format on our free swag store. We have We actually have this... Uh, Cool swag store called sdrstuff.com where we just send sales pro funny and interesting stuff for free. So one of the things we have on there is actually Justin's book. So you can get it through Rightbound for free. So go ahead and check that out and we'll be happy, happy to send you some cool stuff. Hey, Justin, awesome. when, when is your new book coming out? Um, it will be out in December. The pre-order, pre-order link is going to be up. I moved to Wiley, which is mm-hmm. cool. I just keep collecting book publishers, but you've mm-hmm. also supported um, the books and we're really excited to put it out. It's with my business partner, Julian Machinsky, and we, uh, it's on a different subject. It's, it's got some sales stuff, some marketing stuff. It's going to be uh, pretty exciting. And uh, yeah, so look for that. I'll have, we'll have that announcement coming anytime soon. 
And yeah, I just encourage everyone to network with each other on this call. There's some heavy hitters here today. Uh, a lot of folks that I know and some folks that are building stealth uh, tech. So yeah, try to get to the guest list. I don't know if you want to circulate that, Ronnie or Lisa, but go into that networking group and let's get everyone together. It's been a blast. I'll just uh, bid you adieu and uh, see you in cyberspace. Got to go plug myself back into the pod. All right. Thanks, thanks back folks. <laughs> oh, Justin, should I send that email to your, your LinkedIn or you prefer WhatsApp for that review? Whatever you guys want to do. Beautiful. Yeah, I'll, I'll take advantage of that. Thank you. You got it. We'll talk soon. Thank you.